Gold is over $4,000 an ounce, holding in the low 4,000s after a record-breaking run in 2025. Now, that level reflects persistent inflation pressures, sustained central bank buying, and investors hedging risk. This is the Black Hills. Homestake, once America's most productive gold mine, poured over 40 million ounces before closing in 2001. And the district still carries a question, was Homestake alone or the head of a larger system? Line Rock Resources, a small cap explorer is wagering the missing halo could be hiding on private ground a short drive away. And they now have a state approval to drill 78 pads. Rigs are slated to start within weeks. Their primary target is high-grade shear-hosted gold. Now the kicker sits below it, a large pegmatite, the battery-grade lithium, its surface. And layered into the landscape is a tin story that once armed U.S. industry and then went quiet. So these big Precambrian, what we call orogenic gold deposits, they always form in clusters. So when you think about the world's great orogenic camps, you think of like Abbey Tibby in Ontario, Quebec. You think of the Eastern gold fields in Western Australia. Usually these camps, their hallmark is there's one, what we call super giant deposit. One thing that's just bigger than all the rest, right. but then it's surrounded by this halo of world-class large things that are also uh, go on to be very productive mines. Currently, the Black Hills are missing this halo. We have this isolated supergiant sitting here at Homestake and nothing else of significance known for Precambrian deposit. Line Rock's chief geologist, Jeff Hernser, knows this ground. PhD on these rocks, grew up here. He's mapped the Precambrian section and stitched together a land package that locals have guarded for generations. Now, the drill plan now has room to breathe. 78 permitted platforms across the trend. The company says initial coring will run about 5,000 meters, then step outs as results dictate. I would like to see um, a, a really strong gold intercept sitting on top of a strong lithium intercept. So what I mean by strong, we have some pretty reliable historic data that's indicated that we have the potential to cut decameter tight widths at five to 15 gram gold. So I would love to see a drill hole. The first drill hole starting at grassroots cut 50 to 100 meters of five gram plus before passing into a pegmatite that's maybe 30 to 50 meters thick at 2% lithium oxide. That would be a real unicorn. Now, surface work this spring defined a 260 meter gold horizon with chip samples up to 14 grams a ton in bedrock and float up to 189 and a half grams a ton. Now, new UAV magnetic data backs a one kilometer plus corridor and highlights breaks that help pick pads open in all direction. This is going to be our first hole. It's a great hole because we're in the middle of a 100 meter wide golden soil anomaly. We've had rock samples from this exact spot up to 189 gram per ton gold. And that lithium pegmatite is just over here. So with eight holes permitted for this platform, we can adequately test the gold direction in every direction, no matter where it goes, and extend those holes deep enough to cut the lithium pegmatite. So it's kind of our dream choice for a platform. Now beneath the gold target sits the giant Volney pegmatite. It's about 635 to 700 meters long, up to 100 meters wide at surface. A grab and historic samples run about 3 to 5 percent, and with recent fieldwork confirming outcrops of about 3.7 percent, stockpiles up to 5.3 percent. It's untested at depth. You know, in a world where 1%, 1.5% is kind of the economic grade everybody's looking for, we've come here on surface and there's average grades of 3 to 4%. The United States imports the vast majority of its lithium. Only one U.S. mine, a brine operation in Nevada, currently produces lithium. No hard rock operation is in production. A domestic hard rock source would matter to supply chains. It's exciting for us to be able to drill this gold target, but to have multi-commodity, high-grade potential on the same property, and often we can target them in the same drill holes even, so it's great that we have that flexibility that we can respond to whatever we need to. Now, this is private land in a mining town with existing roads and power, and the state regulator, South Dakota DANR, has now approved Lion Rock's drilling permit. Back in September, Lion Rock closed a $5.3 million non-brokered private placement to fund Volney work programs and, of course, corporate purposes. 
In Washington, a March executive order prioritized domestic mineral production and directed agencies to move faster on permitting. It's a signal that gold was being treated alongside the usual critical cohort for policy attention. And meanwhile, the Interior Department has proposed adding minerals such as copper and silicon to the former critical list, part of a broader pro-supply posture. A century ago, Tintin ran one of the largest tin concentrators in the country. It fed wartime industry, then stalled. Market crashes, the World War II L-208 shutdown of U.S. gold mines, and finally fire. The district shifted into history. There was a lot of interest up there, but nobody was able to carry the project through to actual production. Mm -hmm. They brought in machinery, they had it all set up. They just didn't have the financing. So we're standing within the former town of Tinton, now the ghost town of Tinton. This was a company town built by the Black Hills Tin Company in the early part of the 1900s to house their workers as they were mining tin. This was one of the most productive tin mines in the United States. They had government contracts during the World Wars to produce tin that they needed for the war effort. And the town thrived during those periods, but by 1953, the town was abandoned and it's fallen into the state. Tin remains part of the rocks here, and recent stockpile checks still ran about 1% in 13 samples. Now, Line Rock isn't mining tin, but its context and potential byproduct credit if the gold lithium thesis holds. Now, on the market side, tin rallied sharply in 2025, reflecting electronics demand and supply hiccups, a reminder of how secondary metals can strengthen project economics when they're already in the rock. The Black Hills still mine. Coors Wharf keeps pouring gold nearby. Families here grew up with nuggets in drawers and miners at the table. And when a new drill shows up, people notice. All of these families have all controlled their pieces of the Tinton district for over 100 years. Everyone's curious, where did all of this gold come from? Just past the shed, mm -hmm. there's this gate, and he was parked, his truck parked at the gate fiddling with a lock yeah. a couple summers ago. Yeah. He saw a nugget in the dirt, uh -huh. he kicked it out with his boot, yeah. and he showed it to me. It's an inch and a half long. So what's changed since spring? Now, a magnetic survey and 3D inversion sharpened the structural picture and backed continuity along the gold corridor. The state permit is now approved, and the first phase of drilling is scheduled to start within weeks. Now, what are they testing? Gold. Shear hosted zones where field work shows 5 to 15 grams a ton potential over tens of meters in historic work and new samples along a 260 meter trend open. In lithium, the giant Volney pegmatite below the gold with concentration ranges at a surface untested at depth. And finally, tin, that's legacy stockpiles in pegmatite zones that may provide credits if the model hangs together. So even though the property has never been drilled in modern times, um, over 100 years ago, the South Dakota State Mine Inspector, the head of the South Dakota School of Mines, some other really reputable mining engineers did come to the property and they realized that this gold zone exists right next to the pegmatite. And they reported some really impressive numbers from channel samples that were present in some of the underground workings that are no longer accessible, so we can't directly see it. But some of these numbers are just really eye-catching. 61 meters of five grams in one added, 200 meters further along strike to the north, another added that had six meters of 8.2 grams, another drift 400 meters further north along strike, 43 meters of eight grams. These are really, really impressive numbers Crazy. by today's modern standards, and they're practically sitting at surface. And the reason we can't see some of that stuff today is there's been enough mining here in the pegmatite over the last hundred years that they've kind of covered up the gold zone with this veneer of lithium pegmatite debris. So we actually can't see most of the gold zone at surface. So it's really gonna be the core drill that gives us the first chance to see it. So why now? Because gold is north of $4,000 an ounce and it rewards new ounces, but also because U.S. policy is leaning into domestic supply and because private land permitting compresses timelines in South Dakota and also because the geophysics and the field data now point to coherent targets rather than scattered anecdotes. There's good gold there because, first of all, it's underexplored. I mean, it hasn't been looked at seriously for 50 years, over 50 years since Homestake was up there. Just the ge geological layout, it's so fortuitous. It has the right structure, it has 
we have documents that show it's there, but no, no one's ever really carried it all the way through in a modern, comprehensive program. Now, what this is not, it's not a production story. It's an inaugural drill on a district with history, and modern data says drill here first. Now, the company plans to start by testing the rusty corridor along strike and at depth, then tilt holes into the pegmatite as they vector. Now, early assays will guide pad-to-pad -pad decisions here. It's been building this for me for 10 years, uh, so to finally see a drill parked on site at Tinton, it's going to be a real game-changing moment for me. Now, best case, they cut meaningful gold widths and prove they stacked opportunity into the pegmatite. If not, the X-Mag and soil grids provide alternative shots along the corridor. Now, a forgotten halo beside a supergiant and a pegmatite with battery metals in its roots and legacy of tin that powered U.S. industry a century ago, Lion Rock now has the pads, the permit, and the plant. The next chapter won't be written in legend, it'll be written in core. In South Dakota for Kitco Mining, I'm Jeremy Safford.